looking now at a, at a very specific uh, episode and period in Jewish history. Uh, the events that we're going to be covering have to do with what is called the early modern period in Jewish history, which means that uh, in the Jewish past, we look back and we can identify large blocks of time having very specific kinds of characteristics. And everybody's heard of the medieval period in non-Jewish history. We also have such a thing called the medieval period in Jewish history. But the medieval period in Jewish history comes to an end when sharp differences kick in and allow us to separate between A and B, between the medieval times and post-medieval times. Historians love the fact that 1492 is a great year to say that the medieval period ends, for example, in Spain, because all the Jews are kicked out of Spain in 1492, so there's nothing to talk about. So the history of the Jews in, in medieval Spain goes up to 1492, and then boom, it isn't. In a similarly, somewhat different, tragic way, the history of Eastern European Jewry comes to the Holocaust. And then it's over, unfor unfortunately, you understand? But that's easy to peri periodize when you have these violent, uh, you know, happenings. In the, what we're going to be looking at, it's a little more complicated, but it's not that much more complicated. We do the same thing. We say that the Middle Ages, for the Ashkenazic Jews, who we're going to be focusing on, uh, more or less comes to the end also around the late 1400s, say 1492 for argument's sake, approximately, simply because we make the case that uh, significant changes uh, kicked in. In our case, the most significant changes you can see on the map that I have in front of you, which is a map of Europe in the early modern period, uh, is that the, the vast majority of the Ashkenazi Jews will end up in that Poland-Lithuania thing that you can see hopefully on the right-hand side. Do you all you'll see what I'm talking about over there? Okay, light blue. So, uh, in other words, the map of Europe is a little bit simplified because there are only three big countries, correct? Or Eastern Europe, three big countries. If you look over here, you can see Poland, Lithuania. To the right of it is Russia or Muscovy, as they called it at that time. And below it is uh, the Ottoman Empire. So uh, Turkey, uh, Poland, uh, Moscow, and Russia. That's all of Eastern Europe uh, in those periods. This historians call the early modern period because it kind of is different from what had been before, but it's also different from what comes after the French Revolution, the period of modernity. It's an in-between kind of period, and it has its own unique characteristics in non-Jewish history, and it certainly has unique characteristics in Jewish history. For example, the Sephardim are kicked out of Spain and have to relocate in all kinds of ways in the Ottoman Empire, primarily in Italy and places like that, and you get a new type of Sephardim. Just to give you an example, it's not the Rambam anymore with people interested in philosophy and science. It's the Sephardim as we think of them today, okay? which is a post-1492 phenomenon, broadly speaking. When it comes to the Ashkenazic Jews, so originally they were in France, where you all hopefully can see to the left of the map is where France were. That's where Ashkenaz originally was in time of Rashi. Then they were kicked out of there, and they went to the right into that large area with a lot of little countries in it, which is Germany at that time. It's called the Holy Roman Empire. And then, by the time you get to 1492, 1500 approximately, without going through too many details, just take it from me that 95, 98% of the Jews of Germany are kicked out of Germany and have to move to the right to Poland, Lithuania. On the other hand, look how big that is, Poland, Lithuania. That's my point. That's why I want to show you the map. We're dealing with the Polish Empire, or specifically what used to be called the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And that's because there are two big countries over there which united in a personal union the Queen of Poland back in the 1300s, married the Prince of Lithuania, the Agelio dynasty, and their children ser served as rulers of both realms, and this became even more solidified in the 1500s, and so that made them a strong country. The fact they had two countries that joined in a union to create a larger country than the uh, sum of the parts. Very similar thing happened in Spain. Whereas you can see below there, it's one country called Spain. That's the way we think of it now. It used to be two countries, Ferdinand and Isabella, Castile and Aragon. When they united, first through the personal union of the kings, and eventually they really united, they made a powerful country. That's not to say it doesn't have its issues, but it made a powerful country. If you want one closer to home, England, Scotland. Right? You always think of England like one big country, the United Kingdom, as they call it. goes back to a time when... You know, the, the prince of this married the princess of that or something like that, a personal union. And then uh, they eventually joined together constitutionally at the hip. There are some Scotsmen that still don't like it today, but it's been around for a couple hundred years. And that has given England a power. So whenever you're able to do these kind of things, 
it gives you a certain, uh, you know, stability and uh, joint power to using both uh, parties for the common good. Anyway, without developing it too much, suffice it to say, I think that map speaks for itself. Which is bigger, France or Poland? Or even France and Spain is about the Poland's bigger. Right, you can see in that map. So we're dealing with the fact that the Jews get kicked out of, by the end of the Middle Ages, of every country in Europe except Poland. But so what? Poland's bigger than most of those countries. So really, by the time you get to 1500, the Jews were expelled from England, from France, from Spain and Portugal, from almost all of Italy, from Switzerland, from Belgium and Holland and the Scandinavia, from Muscovy, from Hungary. You see what I'm saying? Uh, it didn't happen at one time, but it happened. But so what? They have somewhere to go. It's not like in the Holocaust time there was nowhere to go. You could always go to this big thing called Poland, Lithuania, Poland. And that's where they went. And that's why for most of us in this room, I'll bet you our ancestors come from Poland. Because that's where the mo most Ashkenazi do end up getting dumped. And even if you're from Germany, for example, you call yourself a Yaki, chances are uh, that really your ancestors went to Poland from Germany and then came back to Germany. There are some, not many, real pure, pure blooded, true blue German Jews that lived there all the way through. But that's a minority. You get it? You may possibly be, it, it is possible, that someone, for example, family could have lived in Frankfurt all the way through for the last thousand years and never moved. But it's highly unlikely. It's much, much more likely that you're one of the regular German Jews, which got kicked out of Germany in the, by the time you get to 1500, got dumped into Poland, and sometime after that, made their way back into Poland in the 1700s, the 1800s, even the 1900s. That's the way it goes. Now, the Jewish community in Poland, therefore, is what we're going to be focusing on. But as I'm trying to show you, when you get to the year 1500, and then for the next uh, 500 years or so, 400 years, the 1500s, the 1600s, the 1700s, 1800s, and down to Hitler, down to the middle 1900s, the Jewish community in Poland becomes Rov Minion and Rov Binion of the largest Jewish community by far in terms of quantity as well as quality. No question about that. Uh, in terms of quantity, for some reason or another, nobody knows exactly why, this community that ends up uh, settling and gelling in Poland has a baby boom where no other Jewish communities that we know of ever did. Unless you go back to ancient times in uh, Egypt, you know, the B'nai Yisrael, Paru, Vayishur, Tzubayir, Vayasim, six at one time. But as far as we know from regular history, the Jews in uh, the Sephardim, for example, the Jews in Spain and Italy and Germany and certainly in the West, are always uh, pretty much zero population growth as far as we can tell. It's just interesting. Maybe it has to do with the fact that you had a bad health, so bigger infant mortality, you know, that's possible. But you had also bad health in Poland. For some reason or another, there the population uh, explodes. So if you take it from a small number in the 1500, it's considerably larger in 1600, again considerably larger in 1700, again considerably larger in 1800, and so forth, down till the Holocaust. What Hitler did was to destroy the seedbed of the Jewish people, and the Jews of Poland will supply reinforcements, if you follow what I'm saying, for all the other Jewish communities. As I say, if it was up to the pure German, German, German Jews to keep up the Jews in Germany, they would dwindle away demographically into nothing. For example, the way the non-Jews are dwindling demographically into nothing as we speak, and that's why the Muslims are moving in and taking over Europe. Okay? If it would be up to the Jews in um, uh, you know, France, uh, the West, uh, Italy, and all these places, they would have dwindled into nothing. We see these things happen sometimes in America, don't we? Where certain communities, they just, uh, they don't have kids after a while. The synagogue closes or the other thing closes because there's just nobody there to keep it going. So the Polish Jews, with its overflow, ends up supplying American Jewry, British Jewry, Italian Jewry, and all the rest of it, which is why I say, if you're Ashkenazic, five will get you ten or better that you sometime or another come from this area called Poland, which includes in its left side something called Lithuania, but in the lower side something called Gal Galicia, on the right side something called the Ukraine and Kiev and all that. And, you know, whatever you tell me your great-great-grandparents came from, from Volinia or from Central Poland, it's all part of the area that we call Polish Jewry. If you're Russian Jew, that's just the borders change, that's all, but it's all part of that Polish stuff, okay? If you're Austrian Jew, it's all borders change, but it's all part of that por Polish stuff. Okay, now, there had been Jews in Poland uh, way back when, I mean, w back in the Middle Ages, but they didn't count. By that I mean that in Jewish history, we not only look at where people 
our living, but we also look, as I said before, not simply in terms of quantity, but also in terms of quality. I'll give you an example I'm talking about. There's a ton of Jews living in Buenos Aires today. You don't hear anything about them. A lot more Jews living in Buenos Aires than live in Baltimore, Maryland. In spite of that fact, which is a fact, I can tell you that little puny Baltimore, Maryland makes a large, much larger contribution to Jew, Jewish culture and Jewish uh, vitality uh, than Buenos Aires. Because you have yeshivas here, you have schools, you have this, you have a very rich Jewish life in a way that you don't have over there. There have always been Jewish communities which might have had size or something like that, but were, in the cultural sense, uh, non-contributive decadent, as we might say. And uh, this is true, for example, of the Jews in Poland who live in the 900s, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. You don't hear anything about them. I mean, I could go give you facts and figures. Who cares? Not for our story. But they become significant around 1500. And from that time on, uh, the Polish Jews, if you understand that term in the sense of those living in there, become the dominant force in Jewish life and culture down till today. Whether you realize or not, everybody in this room and everybody everywhere is totally dominated, whether they like it or not, you, know, you, can, you can say it's good or bad, it, it are totally dominated by cultural, Torah, other, religious, and other trends that emerge out of the Polish Jewish community. Right? Uh, the only ones that are not, to some degree or another, are the real pure Sephardim, and even they are, you know, if they, if they want to get down to it. So you name it, in terms of a movement, it comes out of Polish Jewry. The Hasidim, the Misnagdim, the uh, Kabbalists, the uh, Yeshiva types, uh, whatever. Zionism, a socialism, you know, you want your religious type of Jewish culture, you want your non-religious type of Jewish culture. It all emerges out of this incredibly rich, culturally vibrant Jewish community, which was there until the uh, Hitler times. Right? Now, this really begins, as I said before, in late 1400s, early 1500s. And uh, the Jews in Poland will create, at that time, a remarkable uh, community, and therein lies a the tale. Basically, what you're talking about is that uh, Jews from Germany, primarily, have to run away from Germany, Eastern Germany, as you can see on the map over there, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, and have to run into Poland, including their numbers will be some significant scholars who will strike roots in Poland, and it'll take a while for them to get their act together and to interact with the locals and to sort of impose their uh, worldview and culture on the mass of Polish Jewry, but it will happen in a big way and will create a very interesting and remarkable Jewish uh, cultural environment. The person we usually associate this in the beginning is uh, someone we know something about, but not a whole lot about, but is a fascinating individual, Rabbi Jakob Pollock, who was born in Poland, that's why he's called Pollock. Anybody called Pollock means you're a Polak. Right? It's, well, in Germany, a Polak means you're from Poland. It doesn't mean you're a dummy. Okay? I was just in Seattle yesterday, and they did there, if, you, if they don't like somebody, they call them a, a Lachli, right? Lachli, which is, which is a Turkish for Polak. Now, there's a real problem if you've got a Turk calling somebody a dummy because he's a Polak. Okay? What can I tell you? Can I tell you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can tell. Yes, you can. The, uh, you know, the life is strange. Now, the uh, but seriously, the the um, the Ryakopol was born in in in, in uh, Poland, uh, goes at a young age to Germany, meaning he's born in 1470. So at that time, it's still where Germany to the left is the main Malcolm Toro. The anti-Semitism hasn't reached full potency to kick everybody out yet. It's in the process of happening. In the 1400s, the German Jewish communities are under pressure, but they're still holding the line and you still have significant yeshivas and a very rich, old-fashioned German Jewish cultural life. It's still the world of the Trumas Hadeshen or Yaakov Weil, where when people die, they're, you know, they, they're, they're, they burn the, uh, the, what do you call it, the IOUs that people owe them as, as they warm the water for the Hever uh, Kadisha to wash the body, where when the women die, they take their tables and break them up and use them for coffins because this was her Ms. Bea, you know, it's a very old, rich, uh, you know, long-standing uh, culture. There's still the significant yeshivas there, which are under terrible pressure from the non-Jews. The famous big three yeshivas in Augsburg, Nuremberg, and uh, Augsburg, Nuremberg, and Regensburg, um, all of whom have their famous styles of learning. And if you're a Polish Jewish boy, that's where you still go. Uh, he moves to 
uh, goes to learn yeshiva over there. He then marries this uh, daughter of a very rich and powerful family in Prague. Uh, here and starts a movie, a miniseries, uh, imagine from the officials, family, uh, the wife is the iron uh, fist in the family, and uh, she's married at the age of 20 or 21, you know, as was the style in those days, and uh, they stake him out uh, in, in a style that we will see will be very popular in Poland in the 1500s, 1600s. We have a very wealthy uh, father-in-law or mother-in-law, usually a mother-in-law, I mean millionaire, and they say like this, we'll build near Israel just for you. That's what it is. You understand? We, you know, we'll bankroll the whole thing. And, uh, and she does. Uh, she's a ruthless business person, as you'll see. And uh, he becomes a, at, at the age of 22, or 21, 22, he becomes the Rosh Hashiva in Prague, which is a famous old center of Torah life, a member of the Beis Din, uh, which is really kind of remarkable. And uh, soon develops into an extraordinarily charismatic Magid Shir, uh, with uh, trailblazing ideas in Lumdus, very s parallel, not identical with what we would call today the brisker. You know, that's the hot thing now. Set out, he makes his own at that time, as we'll see a certain type of pilpul. And, uh, and then it runs into a, a, a huge uh, fight, like I say, right out of a novel. And I'll read you the basic uh, facts over here, because I would never do it on my own. This is from a Hasidic source. He says, uh, got into a huge fight over a question of miyun, okay? Uh, what happened was that, uh, let's put it this way, he married the daughter of this wealthy family. She has a sister. The father died. I told you the mother was the, mother was the Iron Maiden anyway. And uh, the mother marries the second daughter off uh, to a wealthy uh, Talmud Chacham would say he has a future to be some big Rosh Hashiv also. Uh, but the daughter is like 10 years old, 9 years old. And so she's below Bas Mitzvah level. And uh, if you remember in the Bible it says a father can marry his daughter off at a minor age and it counts. Uh, we had a scandal like that a couple years ago in New York as, as, as some people may remember. Uh, the Talmud says that if the father is dead, the mother can do the same thing, and it works at the level of Midra Bonin, meaning she's too young for it to work at a Kedushin, they're married in Torah, but she's young enough to marry at the level by rabbinic uh, decree. Creates an interesting situation. And what the, I mean, you could see a certain amount of abuse possible. What if they marry off to somebody she doesn't like? No problem. The Talmud says that because it wasn't a Kedushin, mid because it wasn't a fully biblical kind of marriage, so she doesn't need to get if she doesn't want the guy. She simply has to say uh, before she turns 12, or at the time she turns 12, it's a whole question, that I went out. She has a right of refusal called mi'un, like in Manu Mima'en. This is kind of rare, what I just described. Or is it? Uh, you and I would never think of getting involved in these kind of marriage situations. You wouldn't marry your kid off at such a young age. The rich and the powerful did it all the time. If you look in Jewish history, for dynastic reasons, for economic reasons, uh, even though it seems strange to us, the rich and powerful families used to marry kids off at rather young ages. The note of Yehuda writes about the fact that his brother was married off the age of 10 or 11, for example. Even though boys never heard these kind of things. Girls definitely are because, you know, there may be some element of romance possibly in the marriages of the lower class and the lower middle class, uh, but historically there's never been any romance whatsoever in the marriages of middle middle class, the upper middle class, and the wealthy class, all economics. Uh, whether they say it one way or they say it another way, but that's what it's all about. Now, uh, this is true throughout the world cultures, and it certainly was true in Jewish culture, and remember we're talking about a time when there was no unemployment insurance, no social security, no, uh, you know, benefit system, and so people were really looking at how to maintain, you know, the family position and wealth and all that kind of thing. So to make a long story short, they marry her off. Um, she says that she doesn't, when she turns 12 or just before, she says, I went out. She actually, uh, she actually was interested in another guy. Um, 
what are you going to call this? It, it, it didn't go anywhere. You can't call this an adulterous relationship. You know, somebody's 11 years old. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? The, you're talking about a child. But nevertheless, this would happen. Um, she didn't like the guy. And uh, he, on the other hand, wouldn't give her a get. He said he wanted to go through with the marriage. So I told you, we're dealing with a miniseries over here, not just a movie. And uh, this was a scandal in the whole Prague, as you can imagine. And uh, I'll, I'll read you the basic uh, uh, facts of here. Reb David Sener Mechashuvi Air Prague, Nasali Isha Ayalda Sulika. So her name was Sulik. Batem Lob Yudveshana when she was a minor. Ramosha officials, the uh, girl's father was uh, gone. Okay, Mace Ming time. And she uh, grew, she was gone. And Sulik Gogol Basir Valios Lisha Reb David. She didn't want to go through with the marriage. She said she wants to refuse. Her mother supported her. Rechola. Vila of David Sandra Sibyl says get. The, the husband doesn't want to give a get. Shum Sibyl's mama, they tried to persuade him and all that kind of stuff, and he was obstinate. Limda national silica litos, kihoisa, vahoisa, yisoma, meavik, shikicho, David, bischusal mindfit her kedusha. So she was advised then, well, you know, because after all, she's no scholar. Who even in this room heard of this until I just mentioned it now? So they said, you know, there's a way out, and you can do something called mean. You say, you, say, you refuse. And uh, they told her to do this, and her brother-in-law, who's uh, 22, 23 years old, Yaakov Pollock, who I just mentioned before, uh, accepted that idea. He said she can do it. And he said like this, uh, he gave her a, remember, he was a member of the Bays in the Prague, he gave her a heter, you know, to get married. So uh, you can just see uh, the front page of the Prague Jewish Times. Okay. Now, Chachamishim Shona, problem was that uh, we're dealing with Prague, which is part of German Jewry at that time. It's not in Poland, it's part of the Holy Roman Empire, as you can see, sort of one uh, upper, where is it, where it says Habsburg over there, that's that's the area of Prague. Uh, the problem is that Kechamishim Shon Lofnei Mikrizet Tikin Rav Menachem Mimirzberg Mikitolia Poskim. Fifty years prior to this, one of the big German rabbis, for policy reasons, had tried to push across the idea that you can't do me in anymore. And the reason is because there were a lot of abuse in the system. Uh, girls were doing when they were too old. At that time, they already really had. A status of already being married if they did it, you know, when I'll give an example. You're 13 years old, 12, 14 years old. If you haven't said anything, then you were fully married. And uh, they said, no, we're not. And they went ahead and got remarried without a get. And it was a whole, uh, what shall I say, uh, legal hefkera situation happening in places like Germany. And so he was a big Ashkenaz rabbi at that time, although nobody's ever heard of him today. And he tried to get across the idea that we're canceling this option. Uh, so what I'm trying to tell you is the Talmud says you can do it but you've all heard of Rabbeinu Gershom and he said he came back two wives and that got accepted so this person also wanted to do the same thing can't do me and he thought it would also get accepted and he was a big important rabbi at that time and so this attitude spread throughout Germany here you go 40-50 years later and highly elite family wants to go against it and rely on the Talmudic law. Uh, as I said before, you could look on halachic issues, and uh, boom, you have a atomic explosion. Everybody gets involved in it. It was a scandal of the decade or more. Uh, he stood on his grounds, this 22-year-old Rosh Hashiva, young type. Uh, they all say you're doing it because it's your sister-in-law. Uh, he argues very eloquently that, you know, you can't make up a new law against the Talmud. Uh, anyway, it didn't get accepted everywhere. Uh, all the senior rabbis sided with the other side. And to uh, make a long story short, the family just picks up and leaves Prague. Uh, where are you going to go? Because of the hot scandals and fights that are going on. He says, I'm, let's go back to where I used to live, back to Poland, when I grew up. And they go to uh, Krakow, which is not that far away from where Prague is, but it's a whole new country. You know, it's the capital, Krakow. I don't have a thing of it, but you see where it says Habsburg. If you go three, four inches to the right, you're already in, 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 in the area of Krakow. In other words, the capital of the Polish Empire was not that far away. And that's where they relocate. 
And uh, she comes in with a lot of cash. She's a very powerful businesswoman. She successfully re-establishes re re her business in Poland. Uh, she actually uses her contacts from Bohemia to enhance her thing in Poland. She gets in real tight with the Queen of Poland and through with the, with the King of Poland. Uh, and uh, she's even wealthier in other words in Poland than before. Uh, if you want to really add to all the spice, uh, you know, some of her relatives come in, they all start hobnobbing with the Polish court. Some of them get too friendly with the Polish court and convert to Catholicism. Then you have a real big scandal that's a very hush of a rabbinic family, part of who members now join the Catholic Church. It gets uh, really dicey. So the point is that she's able to reestablish her uh, economic power, and she wants to be a boss also in Krakow. And she buys, once again, she sets him up with a big yeshiva. And uh, here, he's even more successful because uh, you don't have all the constraints in Prague. And he sets up what you might call Lakewood, you know? In other words, what I'm describing, although it's tempestuous, is the arrival of a Rabbi Aaron Cutler type, although extremely controversial in Poland. And there's no question that that's the role he fulfills in history and plays a seminal role in the establishment of a Poland as a intense center, by far the most intense center of Talmudic study for the next several hundred years. Uh, this yeshiva uh, takes off like wildfire. Remember, he was in a happy situation, no uh, fundraising. No uh, uh Tuition is free. <laughs> you know, three meals a day, or maybe in those days, two meals, whatever, whatever was considered a paradise, you know, two meals a day or something. Uh, the boys don't have to sleep on the floor, they actually have something called a mattress. It was, uh, you know, quite quite uh, remarkable by the standards at that time, and uh, his yeshiva uh, really took off. There, uh, I might say that you have a very complex uh, outcome because uh, she gets so tight with the Polish government that she gets them to declare her son-in-law uh, the chief rabbi of Poland, basically. See? Certainly the chief rabbi of the Krakow area, which was the capital area of Poland, um, the local Jewish communities do not like this, um, and for interesting reasons. All this is going to be very common, everything I'm describing, although it sounds unique, is going to be part of the weird, zany uh, pattern of Jewish life in Poland over the next several hundred years. You understand? Uh, the uh, super Rosh Hashiva, the uh, incredibly uh, high level of learning and intense level of learning, the uh, strange interlocking relationships between the uh, elements of the Jewish upper classes on the one hand and the Polish ruling class on the other. The resentment of this on the part of the regular uh, class of Jews. Um, they move heaven and earth to get the appointment uh, quashed. Uh, the communities historically do not like the Goyesha government to tell who's going to be the rabbi, and they're right. Uh, this is a system fraught with big abuse. If the king tells you who should be your uh, rabbi, you, you know, what if he tells you tomorrow, you, you, you know, go be Michal Shabbos or something like that? Or, you know, if the, the Jewish community is supposed to be the leftover of the state of Israel in Gullis. That's the theory behind it. Right? Once upon a time we had a kingdom. Now we no longer have a kingdom, but we have a shtickel kingdom. We have as much autonomy as we can get. The whole glory of the Jewish community was that we have a certain amount of self-rule which the non-Jews give us. If they start saying who should be the rabbi, who should be the chazan, who should be... Uh, how much tax should be paid, and all the rest of it, uh, the, the, there will be no autonomy, and the Jews will become uh, puppets. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use an extreme example of what I'm talking about, but you'll understand what I mean. Think about the things that the Nazis set up, the Jewish Council, the Judenrat, right? Uh, was that a uh, Jewish self-government? Uh, the opposite. That was a abuse of it. Now, I'm not saying this is the same thing, but it smacks of it, and therefore, the Jews very much resent it. To add... Um, fuel to the fire. Uh, it was a big uh, fire broke out in Krakow that year, uh, even though it didn't it hit both sets of houses. Uh, they blamed it on the Jews. Uh, the people used this to, you know, uh, his enemies of Rabbi Yaakov Pollock say, you know, he's somehow responsible for it. It gets a whole huge mess, and he's thrown in jail until she, she, till the mother-in-law bails him out. Uh, I, do you have enough uh, material here for a couple of stories, uh, and then a huge debate breaks out over a case of a mafkin and a nifka, in other words, uh, over a $12,000 din Torah, where 
you know, another famous rabbi elsewhere sides with one side and he sides with another side. He get tempestuous, constant politicking is the order. They, he have, a, ends up, seems to have uh, to leave the country and go there. He's for 10 years until he comes back. It is what it is. But in the course of all this politics that I'm throwing at you, uh, he established a very important yeshiva, you know, sort of, like I said before, I used the metaphor of Lakewood, which uh, really took off and attracted hundreds of students. And some of his best students started their own yeshivas. And the result was that in the course of all this, in the early 1500s, uh, Poland becomes uh, the Iker Mokum Torah in the world. It remains that way until the Holocaust, without, a, without question. You understand? Now, Poland comes a place where there are more yeshivas than anywhere else, and more intensely studied, it seems, than anywhere else. And uh, you'll see in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, just like today, people send their kids to learn in Israel, or maybe they'll, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll go you know, they'll, you know, to, to, to America, some of you was in America. At that time, Jews from all over the world, including from the Sephardic lands, and from Italy, and from Amsterdam, places like that, if they want their kids to really learn, will send their kids to the kingdom of Poland, even though you wouldn't ordinarily think of Poland today as the headquarters of great culture. But it was for the Jews, and it also was for the non-Jews, because in the period I'm talking about, in the 1500s, believe it or not, Poland was one of the most advanced uh, and culturally developed countries anywhere. I know it's hard for us to think of that way, but uh, you know we're thinking of the model of the dumb Polak, but that was not the case. A Polish empire in the 1500s was very closely connected, for example, to Italy, was a major center of the Renaissance. I'm not giving a test over here and asking you to remember who are the scientists and the architects uh, you know, who characterized the, what they call the brilliant period of Polish culture. I can just throw you the name of Copernicus to give you one example. Okay? Uh, we ordinarily don't think of this as something coming out of Poland. Now, believe me, the Poles know this, and they kick themselves, like, how do we go wrong, and how do we lose this, and all the rest of it. But once upon a time, they had it. And so don't be surprised if the Jews, who are now located in Poland, will in their own uniquely Jewish way uh, parallel this. As I say before, in a uniquely Jewish way, they're not going to be part of the Polish Renaissance, but they're going to develop, so to speak, a Jewish one. But what do we mean by the term Jewish Renaissance? So here I have to explain a very key point in all this. And that is, the Jews will get rich, as I'll explain in a minute, or many Jews will, in Poland in the 1500s. But they're going to bring their cultural attitudes from Germany with them. And the result is going to be a highly unusual situation, which I don't know ever exists anywhere else, unfortunately, in which the rich people are going to express their wealth not by supporting uh, artists and painters and poets and things like this, as Jews may have done in other cultures, but by supporting learning, by supporting yeshivas. You know, we live in America, and I have to tell you that it's tough. Uh, we don't get any real money from the guys with the big money. We get little money from the people with the big money. I'm not even in the business of raising uh, funds. But whatever, <coughs> excuse me, you get for the TA, Beit Yaakov, near Israel, Rambam, or you name it, <coughs> even if somebody gives, as they rarely do, a million bucks, uh, that's a drop in the bucket compared to what they spend on other Narish guys. I'll just give you one example. Compare with the Harry Weinberg for just one, one example of many. What they spend on Jewish things, let alone Torah things on the one hand, versus what they spend on other things. And if you take the trouble, you can, I'm sure you can look it up online, uh, what Jews, I'm talking about Jews, spend on all kind of Mishigasen is in the tens of millions. Again, I'll just drop you one out of many. Uh, Bloomberg, a couple years ago, maybe some of us remember, the mayor of New York, gave 325 million Hopkins. Because he went to Hopkins as undergrad. Now, you want to cry? Let's say he gave $300 million. I don't care to YU, to Nehru Israel, to something like that, to TA, or anything the equivalent. Free tuition, forever. Would that cause a revolution in American Jewry? Of course it would. You know, the number one killer of the family today is the tuition. The number one impediment, I dare say, of many things is things like tuition. Imagine, in other words, there are people in this country who, if they felt like it, can drop that kind of bucks on what we know is the most important institutions of Jewish per self-perpetuation. But they don't do it. Like I said, if you go and you, go, and, and you got Bloomberg to give, a, I'm just making this up, they got Bloomberg to give a million bucks to YU, it would be a big deal. Even though he gave 300 and over 300 million to a thing like Hopkins. Uh, years ago, I was uh, with Karen at the uh, art school dinner, uh, once they, you know, they honored the writers. And they introduced all these big shots at the art school who's contributing money and uh, who gave something for the art school Gomorrah's, which was a prestigious thing thanks to their 
social context. So this guy gave a million here, a million there, but when they get up, they say, you know, John and Susan over here, they pay for the whole medical school in the University of Alabama. The other one pays for, the, the, the other, uh, I'm serious, the other one pays for the symphony of the state of North Carolina. Uh, so the Jews get a little bit, and the other things get a huge amount. Not in Poland in the 1500s, 1600s, and 1700s. There, they created a culture, this Yaakov Pollock that I'm describing, uh, made, he had a charismatic personality that we can't exactly know because we have a dearth of, of historical evidence, but he clearly captured the imagination of the young people in Poland at that time so that he served as a model that people said, when I grow up, I want to be like him, and if not, I want to be involved in the same kind of enterprise, and if somebody has a lot of money, man or woman, the way they're going to get their prestige is by supporting Torah institutions. Therefore, you'll find that people will strive, and instead of saying I'm giving money to uh, Johns Hopkins or to, uh, you know, this is, uh, the Audubon Society, they're going to give it to Mickey Yeshiva in Krakow and in Lublin and in, the, you know, uh, uh, Vilna or wherever it is all across the country. Uh, women will be very famous for this, by the way. This is interesting. Uh, very often it's the mother-in-law, or very often it's an uh, old grandmother who leaves behind in a will uh, for a kolel, which they use called in those days a kloiz, which means they have uh, five or ten people, generally speaking, who are going to have a fixed stipend, and that means that she has to leave a uh, Karen Kayemet, you know, a, a, a established fund w uh, in, in safe investments of, let's say, for example, a million dollars or two or three million dollars, and the uh, dividends of which can support, as they say, I'm just making this up, five people or ten people to learn full-time for ten years until they become big rabbis. And that is how people express their uh, social uh, advancement. So you have a perfect storm in a positive sense that you had money and, uh, and, and uh, culture uh, coming together in ways that you didn't have in Jewish co countries elsewhere. The Jews in Italy don't act this way generally. The Sephardim don't act this way generally. The uh, Jews in uh, earlier Germany hadn't quite, did this to some degree, but didn't have that kind of money. Right? It's uh, kind of unique to Poland. You, you follow what I'm saying? The Jews in Egypt, they spend their money on Michigasen. The Jews in Morocco, the same way. The Jews elsewhere, that, that's the typical. What I'm describing is the atypical. And because of this financial and economic underpinning, they're able to create what they call the golden age of, Jew, of Polish Jewry. Okay. And I won't say it's all due to Rabbi Yaakov Pauk, but people like that, who, as I said before, capture the imagination and make it uh, hot. Uh, it's also true that the Jews coming into Poland are Ashkenazi Jews, the ones who are dominating the culture. Ashkenazi Jews were, for a variety of reasons, for a long time, into cultural insularity. That's just who they were. Goes back, I've discussed this in other occasions, the, unlike the Jews lived in Arab countries and could read Arabic and therefore, like the Rambam, could participate in general culture, they could read books in, uh, you know, philosophy, mathematics, science, if they wished to. By contrast, the Jews, originally, when they lived in places like France and Western Germany, the language of culture in Christian Europe was Latin. Nobody read Latin, unless you want to be a priest or you know, the rare oddball individual, Jewish, Jewish people didn't do that. They knew the local language in order to do business. You know, like Rashi knew French and people would do German or a variety of German called Yiddish. Uh, that they knew because you can't live in a country without picking up some of the language in order to do business. But culture for many centuries in Christian Europe was Christian. Uh, there was no secular culture at all prior to the Renaissance. Therefore, over many centuries, the Jews had developed the attitude of insularity. There's nothing to read out there. The only thing we can read is our own books. We better concentrate on reading our own books and mastering them. If the Rambam is, so to speak, the poster boy for Sephardic Jewry at its most culturally uh, integrated, because the Rambam, in addition to being the great Rambam of the Mishnah Torah, also, as we know, was a great doctor and a philosopher and all the rest of it, by contrast, the poster boy for the Ashkenazi Jews would be who? Rashi who, uh, as far as we know, uh, didn't know and didn't care about what's going on in this French culture. And he lived in Champagne. And, you know, I don't think Rashi was into the Chanson de Roland or whatever. Uh, was. I'm serious. You know, that was a big poem at that time. Or things of this nature. Beg your pardon? Rashi yeah, Brown, don't tempt me into that. No, Brown, everybody was, as you know, everybody sold wine. The, um, no, but seriously. The, Therefore, these are attitudes that build up and become what we call today yeshivish. If, if the father did it, and the son did it, and the grandson, the great-grandson did it, after a while, this is called being Jewish. 
right? That if you're an Ashkenazi, you live in France and then in Germany and then eventually in the Poland, being Jewish means you do Jewish things. Uh, what the outside world does is what the outside world does. We're indifferent to it. Right? Now, what about the fact that the outside world was radically changing culturally? So by the time they get to Poland, there's something called the Renaissance, which means it's not only Christian anymore. Since my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, my great-great-great-grandfather did it for so many generations, the attitude among the Jews who end up in Poland being the arbiters of culture is, we don't care what the Goyim are doing. You know, the Renaissance is nice, it's interesting. Maybe they pick up here and there. It's very clear that people like the Ramon and the Marshal, if you know about it, were aware of cultural trends going on at that time. In the same way that people in this room, I imagine right now, are generally aware possibly of some cultural trends, but certainly don't really participate in it. Who here subscribes to a magazine of high culture and, you know, let alone things like, and who in America altogether has heard of philosophy today? Who can, who in this room could, I always ask this question, who knows the name even of a contemporary philosopher or, you know, a leading intellectual figure? It's rare, okay? Whereas once upon a time, it wasn't that way. So, uh, these Jews bring these attitudes together and uh, as they say before, you have a perfect storm. You have people who are gonna make money, you have people who are culturally insular, you have people who now see people like Rock, Yaakov, Pollock, and others as these Rashivas are the uh, rock stars, which is what, really what they were looked at. And, uh, and everybody really dreams of the fact, boy, I'd like to make a lot of money making yeshiva, and we'll call it the cat's yeshiva. You see? And that would really uh, be something. And then people would look back and say, oh, he or she was a great benefactor of Torah and all, and all the rest of it. You see? So this kind of synergy is sort of unique uh, to Poland. The only other piece I have to throw into it tonight is the economic one, and that is where well, the Jews don't simply end up going into Poland because they have nowhere left to go, we have to ask ourselves the question, if every other country in Europe kicked the Jews out, why didn't Poland? Right? You know, I've concentrated on the Jewish side of the story. Uh, why did the Poles say, the Russians don't want you, the, the Scandinavians, the, the Belgians, the, the, the Germans, the French, the Spanish, the, you know, it must be true. They're really scum of the earth. I mean, believe me, in these centuries, you have no idea of the low estate in which Jews were held. I mean, you just have to understand. I'm going to tell you something. I mentioned it the other day elsewhere. I'll tell you something I bet you don't know that will shock you. In uh, the Turkish Empire, you see over there, the Ottoman Empire, in most of the places in the Turkish Empire, if you were Jewish, you were not permitted to convert to Islam. Jews are too low of a dog and a scuzzball to be admitted into the Islamic Ummah community. That would be an insult to Islam. They're disgusting creatures. If a Jew really wanted to convert to Islam, they say, first you have to become a Christian, and then you convert. They, I'm serious. They would say, go to the priest, get converted to him, and then come. Then it will be a Christian converting to Islam. All right. You know what I'm saying? Christians are sort of like worthy a a opponents. Jews are the dogs of dogs. Uh, you can't imagine uh, in the Islamic culture what it is to call somebody a Jew or to say that your ancestor was Jewish. I know they talk now about religion and peace and all the rest of it, besides the obvious lies of all that. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you how Islam traditionally uh, viewed the Jews. Now, a clever Jew, could, you know, especially with education, could hook up, as they end up doing in the Turkish Empire, with a sultan or a pasha or very much somebody in the harem. You know, you, you, could, you could get around it if he was very clever, but that's the exception. The rule is that you're a dog of a dog, and as they said before, think about the fact they won't let you even convert. That there'll be a chilol Islam, whatever, to allow someone who's, to, 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 to allow someone. So same thing, not quite, but it's very similar in Europe. A Jew is like, the lowest of the low. So why did the Poles let him in? So the answer is, for the same reason that we let the Mexicans in. In this country, the last 30 years, uh, and more, it's just a notorious fact. They got all kind of laws in the books. They don't allow illegal immigration in. And they do. It's an interesting fact that we call ourselves a country of laws, and yet presidents of the United States who take an oath to uphold the Constitution and protect the laws of the United States will come in openly and say, we're not going to enforce the immigration laws. And what's the answer they always give you? They're doing jobs that other people don't want to do. Uh, Bush said it. Obama says it. Uh, he's attacking Arizona now, but that's basically what he's saying. Bush Sr. said it. Clinton said it. It's not a matter of what, what party is. It is what it is. In other words, what you're saying is economic tr trumps everything else. That's very characteristic of a society in which 
it's really capitalistic. In other words, the money people are the ones that have the final say. So the laws don't really count. Uh, they control which laws count. Right? There are laws in the books, but <laughs> we all see that uh, they're selectively applied. Okay? I mean, we're living this as I speak. So in a somewhat similar vein, Poland at this time was going through a process in which the nobles were gaining uh, more and more power. They had had plenty of power already earlier, but they increased it exponentially in the 1500s. Uh, Poland, this whole area that you see over there, that blue area, was uh, divided up, almost all of it, not all of it, but almost all of it, into thousands of pieces of land owned by noblemen. Uh, the king had his land, but so did others. Some of the nobles had a lot more land than the king did. Uh, furthermore, in the 1500s, the nobles are able to when the Yagolian, Yagolonian dynasty died, the one I mentioned before, uh, make a new con a clause in the constitution that from now on the king will be elected. And uh, that it won't never be a father and son. Uh, that way you make sure that no family will get a lot of power. And that way you're making sure that uh, there'll never be uh, Henry VIII will arise. A, a king that's too strong for them. Uh, they also had in the ancient Polish uh, constitution, the famous rule of the, no, uh, unanimous, uh, liberum veto as they call it. No law can, uh, is passed in Poland unless it's a unanimous in the Polish parliament. And the Polish parliament is the collection of the nobles. Uh, that's an ironclad guarantee that no law will get passed that could possibly uh, hurt the interests of a single nobleman. Let me ask you the following question. How many laws would get passed in the United States of America if you had that unanimous? Do you, do you realize uh, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, there was still one who put it against the war? You know, that's Jeanette Rankin. You get what I'm saying? It wasn't the whole con. You'd think they, the Japanese bombed us, and Roosevelt gave that famous speech, a day will live in infamy, and everybody was rah, rah, rah. But there's one that was against it. It was Poland. <laughs> So the point is that for their own reasons, they developed a kind of a political system which by its very nature was one that militated against a strong king and a strong national sense of policy and rather was uh, decentralized. This was good for the Jews. Right. Why was it good for the Jews? It means that uh, the people who are in charge of the power are strictly looking at economics. And that's their most important value rather than national culture or things like this. Now, this whole blue area of Poland and Lithuania, there aren't that many Poles in it, and not that many Lithuanians. I mean, I'm serious. They were a ruling class. It's a major part of our story. The Poles were defined in those days, not in these national ethnic terms that we have today, but they were defined as a bunch of nobles. I think, if I remember correctly, there were 17,000 of them altogether. Right? 17,000 nobles and their families. That's not a lot from an empire of millions. So, you understand what I'm saying? The term Poland itself was in their minds, Polish historians tell us this today, was in their minds, you know, coeval with uh, the notion of a elite class. And they owned almost all this land. In addition to this uh, group of nobles that owned all the land, there was a relatively small middle class. They're Polish, they're educated, they're college grads, uh, let's say like this, they teach in university, uh, they're doctors, uh, their teachers, uh, perhaps their uh, middle and high merchants, very few of them. The vast majority of the population, peasants, uh, uneducated, slaves. Actually, they were serfs, so they really were slaves. So it's a Medina in which there's a small group of people that own everything. Uh, everybody else is their uh, serfs, very similar to the United States of America today. No, no, but, but uh, and uh, it, it was formerly in there. And so the policy of Poland is obviously made by these people and they own land. How are you going to develop it? They're not sending their kid to uh, the Harvard Business School, uh, not in the 1600s, not in the 1500s. So what are you going to do? They're going to hire the help. Right? This is what third world countries do today. Let me ask you a question. Who runs all the 
technical stuff in Saudi Arabia and in the uh, Gulf states and in uh, other third world territories. Uh, Non-Arabs, right? They'll import people from Europe, uh, from, uh, from India and uh, China and Japan and America if necessary to operate all the technical stuff. Right? Maybe they have long-term plans to wean themselves away from it, but never quite works. The new technical stuff is always you have to bring in foreigners. You understand what I'm saying? It's not a country like America or England where locals do it. And actually, if we want to be honest about it, right now we're outsizing everything. You know, so uh, you pick up uh, for your credit card and talk to somebody in India. They do. Why do they do that? And why aren't they worried about a uh, loss of American jobs? Because the people who make the laws in this country are also concerned primarily for economic welfare. They don't care about anybody else. So when you have that mentality, the nobles then said like this, uh, how are we going to economically develop the land? A nobleman uh, hunts, fights, governs, administers. And they did a pretty decent job of that. Uh, administering successfully knows you have to hire the right people and uh, delegate responsibility successfully. Isn't that right? Um, there are no poles around, not really. So they're bringing outsiders. And anyway, if you bring in outsiders, uh, they'll compete among each other to give you the best price. You get the best uh, aspects of the marketplace. So these nobles bring in uh, Scotsmen, Italians, Armenians and Greeks, Germans. Uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting a couple different nationalities. Famous groups and ethnic groups that are renowned for business skills. You know how it goes out there. Not every group in the world is renowned in business areas. Some are and some aren't. I'll give you an example today. The Chinese are very well known. They go all over the world. They're very good in business. Correct? Arabs are too. Uh, Greeks are. I never heard of uh, the Paraguay, uh, you know, all, uh, all over the world. Right? You don't hear too, it's true. You don't hear too much about the Zimbabwean, uh, you know, uh, uh, industrial, but you hear about the Indian ones. It is what it is. So the groups I'm talking about in that time were renowned for their business acumen and, and things like this. The Scots, as I say before, the Germans, the French, the uh, Italians had this, the Jews. One of the groups, not the only one of the groups is the Jews. Uh, Jews come in and uh, generally speaking, they will find a way to be of economic service to the nobles and uh, they'll have to compete in a ruthless war which is encouraged by the nobles because the more competition you get among the different groups, the better product they get in the end. Isn't that right? The French guy says, listen, you give my cartel this job to mine your copper and market it elsewhere, and we can promise you a half a million dollars a year. The Italian comes along and says, I can make it 550. The Greek comes along and says, I can take you seven, 700,000. Now they're cutting into their own profits, obviously, but they're doing it for the purpose of capturing a market and killing the competition. Uh, the poor Yid is going to say, "Yes, I can give you, I, I can get you eight hundred fifty thousand dollars. Leave him, uh, you know, ten thousand dollars as profit, but it's better than nothing." You see, and uh, there emerges a ruthless war of business competition encouraged by the nobles in the 15 and 1600s between these different sets of economic network cartels as I said before, between the Armenians and the Greeks and the, uh, uh, what is it, the French and the Italians and all the others that I said, the Germans, the Jews win. You see? And they win because of what I said before. They'll, they'll go the cheapest and they'll make the biggest sacrifice in order to get it. You understand? Um, now, I want you to understand. Uh, if you make 1% of $100, it's not a lot of money. If you are able to get a huge uh, contract, 1% is a lot. And so the result is that the Jews find a way to be of service, uh, ruthlessly be of service to the nobles. And uh, for that reason, there's not the slightest effort ever during the period the Jews are in Poland and Lithuania to expel them. You understand? W when all the other countries were kicking the Jews out, as I said before, it never even popped up in the Polish parliaments or at places like this to get rid of the Jews any more than is realistic today to say they're going to send all the Hispanics back. It's not happening. You know, whether you want it or not, it's not happening. Uh, they could do it, uh, but they never would. However, there's one extra point over here. In this country, people are afraid. 
too many foreigners coming in, they'll take over the country. I'll give you an example. They're worried Mexico is going to get back to the Mexican War. This country took from Mexico, as you may know, uh, California, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and so forth. Uh, there's a political threat. Jews, no political threat. Every Polish nobleman and every Polish Catholic knows those Jewish dogs can be kicked out at, at any moment, which was true. There, there, there's not a chance that they can ever uh, take over the country. Furthermore, the Jews are 100% aware of this also, and you know and I know. The Jews had no interest in taking over Poland. They were simply happy if they'd be allowed to live there and, so to speak, be left alone and make a few bucks on the side. If the Jews will be allowed to have their own communities and build a yeshiva or something like that, uh, you know, they'll consider themselves to be almost in a paradise. To a prisoner trapped in a jail, if you double the size of the jail and put in a flower pot or two, especially you send them a salami, <laughs> what more do you need? Right? He thinks he's doing good. That's the unfortunate reality the Jews are in in the 15 and 1600s. You, know, you look elsewhere, and it's so bad that Poland, uh, even if they spit on us, and even if they hold us in contempt, uh, if they leave us the heck alone, and there's no attempt to uh, kick anybody out, and you have full religious freedom. Granted, you have religious freedom because they hold your religion in contempt, and they figure what these Jews do in the synagogue is so ridiculous, we're not even going to pay attention to it. Fine! There are more as I'll speak about next week. We're going to close down in a minute. The Ramah, who emerges as an iconic rabbinical figure in the 1500s. Rabbi Yaakov Pollock has a son-in-law, and his son-in-law has a son-in-law, and that's the Ramah. So this is from the elite top families. Uh, they're all millionaires or married to millionaires. Uh, they all have these uh, sweetheart deals where they have whole yeshivas which are bankrolled by one person. They don't have to have any fundraisers. Uh, they don't have to worry about some rich person stepping on their toes. They're richer than the rich person. Yeah, it was a rabbinic uh, paradise. They, they fantasize about this today. Uh, Drama writes to a student of his who got a stella, a position as rabbi of a community in Germany. And it's very famous. He writes to me, so I guess, I'm happy, very happy for you because you're a close student of mine that you ended up with a position, all the rest of it, but uh, not me. I'd rather have a, a dry crust of bread here in Poland than a big meal in Germany because you have all the anti-Semitism there, and it's not worth it. Now, believe you me, the Ramah did not have a dry crust of bread in Poland. Okay? The Jews of Poland did a lot better than that, but you understand what he's saying by it. They considered the relative absence of anti-Semitism. I repeat, the relative absence of anti-Semitism. What was in Germany versus what they didn't have in Poland to be a paradise. And so we have over here the foundations for what, as I uh, said, was the uh, most significant a Jewish community, uh, certainly in the last five, six hundred years, without question, arguably even longer than that, and uh, which will emerge as one of a seminal influence in the formation of anything Jewish. Uh, in the 1500s, and as time goes on, there'll be more and more, by the time we get to the 1600s, it's not even a question that they're leaving the Sephardim behind in the dust. It's not even a question. And uh, we'll try to round this out with the remarkable uh, culture that the Polish Jews develop. And, 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 and then, of course, uh, you'll see why it was that what happened in 1648 and 1649 really came as a thunderclap to them. It was uh, completely unexpected. And uh, they weren't sure how to react. It's not the way the story was supposed to go. The way the story was supposed to go is they live happily ever after in Poland until the Mashiach comes. Same way like the American Jews today. You live happily ever after in Baltimore or wherever, and then one day you'll get a phone call uh, get on the plane, the apartment is all built for you, and, you know, uh, it, was a, it, was, it was a seamless and, and painless uh, process. And, and then, then, of course, they get their, their wake-up call. That's it for tonight.